So um, I will be talking, let me just start sharing the screen today uh, about the skin. And uh, I'm a pediatrician and a dermatologist, and I'm a head of the department for pediatric dermatology at Gosh. And I have been treating patients with TS for the last 10 years, and I do the TS clinic. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of experience in adults, and I have to say that in, in advance, uh, but I do see all the pediatrics, so up to the adolescence years, they stay with me. I'm still in the hospital, so if someone budges in, uh, please apologize for, for that. Uh, but let's dive in. So how I imagine this to run today, I will, I will tell you about uh, skin changes in tuberous sclerosis and then how they are treated. And then I would love questions or even experience and you can type them in the chat or we can, we can talk up, 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 um, uh, after, after I go through all of that. So the, in tuberous sclerosis, everything is on the spectrum, as you will know. So skin is included. So you can have very mild skin changes, or you can have very severe, you can have only a few, or you can have all of them, or you can almost have none of them. Uh, usually something is present, though. So when we really examine the skin, even though it was not noted in the past, if someone is diagnosed quite late, um, they might not have all of them expressed. However, when we look for them, we, we might find some of them. And they, it, it does, it does depend. So some, it, the timing when they appear uh, is on this slide. So usually it starts with hypomelanotic macules, then facial angiofibromas, then fibrocephalic plaques, chagrin patches, and unguel fibromas. I will explain each one of those because sometimes the, the names can be quite um, intimidating. So I will start with, but this is the order we will run them through. So hypomelanotic macules, or also they're called ash leaf spots. So if we break them down, hypo means less, melanotic means pigment. So and macula is flat patch on the skin. This is something we use, dermatologists use when we describe skin changes. So it means paler patches on the skin and they are completely flat. If you close your eyes and run your fingers over, they are flat. So they, they are not raised, they are just the color change in the skin. And they're very common. So 90% of TS patients will have them. And most commonly they're on trunk and legs. And this can be present at birth and it can be one of the first signs of TS. So, uh, as I said, earliest indicator. If there are tiny, tiny lesions, which I will show you the photograph, we call them confetti lesions. And this is how they look like. So on the left, you have ash leaf um, spot or hypopigmented macules. And then on the right, you have those confetti lesions, which are tiny, tiny um, uh, lesions that they are present. Um, they don't or they can fade in the adulthood, but not necessarily. Uh, and if there are any adults, uh, as uh, uh, adult patients with TS, I would love to hear how, how they behave in, in, on your skin. Then the next one is facial angiofibromas, and they were historically called facial adenoma sebation. We use now the name angiofibromas. And to break down the name, Angio means vessels, fibroma means tissue. So they have two components. You can see the red component, so that's angio component of component from the vessel because they're made from two things. And then fibroma, which is the tissue, so they're red bumps. So the redness comes from the vessels. And about 75% of patients have them. And usually they appear between two to five years of age. Um, they might appear later. They might occasionally appear sooner, but usually later than sooner, because usually at two years of age, we will start seeing them. And they can be worsening during the puberty. And in some patients who have not been diagnosed, they can be mistaken for acne, um, which I understand why that's, that occurs, especially if they are diagnosed in their teenage years, uh, because that's the first thing you will think about teenagers, they have acne. Um, they appear as a butterfly, almost like a butterfly rash over the cheeks, over the nose, and then a bit on the chin. So the nasolabial folds, those are those folds here, are affected. And they can be quite difficult when they're present here around the nose in this nose crease. 
Um, severity again varies from patients to patients. I have patients who were very young, had very severe disease, and I have patients who um, had barely noticeable disease. Um, so that's again very different from, from patient to patient, as again is a spectrum. So this is how they what we've described. So they start as the slightly raised bumps on the cheek, and then when they become redder on the other side, on, on, the, on the photograph on the right side, and they become thicker with time. The problems that they cause is usually bleeding, especially if because they can be itchy and they can be scratched off and they, they can be trickle of the blood, which can be very annoying. They can be irritating. And also, unfortunately, they can be sometimes disfiguring. And of all the signs, skin signs of TS, they're the most visible ones because it's usually what you see from me today is the face. And because they are present on the face, this is how we communicate. They can impact the self-esteem and um, uh, that's why we are more aggressive in treating them. Then the next one, they usually appear at the same time as the angiofibromas and is regarded as being a similar in tissue as angiofibromas is something that's called fibrocephalic plaque. So fibrous means it's made of heart tissue. Cephalic means it's on the head. Uh, plaque means slightly raised. So it's not like a bump that you would have around that. Plaque means is a slightly raised lesion. Again, dermatology expression, expression that we use. Um, so if we put all of that together, they are, they are skin colored, slightly raised, but flat top bumps. And they can be present at birth or appear between, again, similar to angiofibromas between two and five years of age. Uh, they can be, uh, they're usually present on the forehead, but about 60% can be present elsewhere on the face. And as I said, when we have a look at the tissue, they're very similar to angiofibromas. So you can see two different types here. One is in the scalp, and then the other one is present on the forehead, but we usually see them on the forehead. And then we have chagrin patch. It's about 40% of patients with TS has that one. Uh, they are made of thickened skin. Usually it's present on the lower back. So we will find them on the flank area. But you can, they can be also found elsewhere on the back or buttocks or thighs. And again, they're made of fibrous tissue. So very similar to that hard tissues that we find in scars. And this is how it looks like um, when we see them. And usually the most usual bit is when I will undress the child, I'll, I'll lift the, the shirt up to see uh, whether they are present on the lower back, but we will have a look elsewhere whether they are present. They usually don't cause lots of troubles uh, because they're usually hidden unless they would have a bit of rubbing with trousers. Um, but uh, so it rarely cause problems and we rarely treat them just for, for, for that reason. And then we come to the last one. And I know that I said a few years ago, I don't have any nail, any patients with nail lesions. Um, and then in, in the same clinic appointment, I got two. So it's never say never for things in medicine. Um, so nail lesions are either periungual or some subungual fibromas. And I will again break this down, what each word means. So peri means around, sub means under, angle means nail. And fibroma again is the hard skin lesion or the skin lesion that is made of fibrous scar-like tissue. So they can be either present anywhere around the nail, as you can see it here in the bed nail, growing out almost from the bed nail. And as I said, usually not present in children, but you can be surprised as I, I was, or they can be present under the nail. So I will just show you the photographs, how they look like. So this one is periangual. So it's present just on the nail bed and they can distort the nail growth because if they're close to the nail bed down here, then they can press where the nail is growing out because what you see from our nails, that's that tissue. But where the nail is growing down, if you apply pressure to this, you can see the distortion of the nail that it causes. 
And if they're present under the nail, they can push the nail upwards and then opening that gap, causing infections. And if they're, pain, if they're present on the toes, they can be painful when a patient is wearing shoes. So this is how, again, I was describing. So we have subangual one, which is present under the nail, pushing the nail upwards, widening that gap so infection or pain can occur. And then we have the ones that are present around the nail. And if they're present close to the nail bed, they can distort the growth of the nail. Skin tags are common in in, in wider population. So they're not sign of a TS. So not one of the major signs as we described until now, but I've noticed a few of my patients do have them and they look like darkest, very soft skin growths and they can be on the face, usually on the neck and sometimes in the armpits and in the groin area. And this is how they look like. So they are very soft lesions. But again, you will see that in a general population quite a lot. So for that reason, they are not regarded as a, a major sign of TS. And another one which is quite common. So if we all examined uh, our skin, we will each. It's very common in general population to have cafe au lait spots, which are just darker spots that we have on the skin, uh, they're flat, they're macules as we described before, um, but they are common in neuro neurofibromatosis. And if you have a certain amount of them, like six or more, uh, that's one of the major signs of neurofibromatosis. However, we do see them occasionally in patients in TS, but they are not specific for TS. We just notice they're a bit more common in patients with TS. Okay, I will now go through all of them and talk about the treatment, but I will talk about one of them the most. And this is, those are angiofibromas because they are mainly located on the face. That's why we give them the most, um, that's why we, we look at them the most and treat them quite aggressively. So this is how it all started. In July 2010, we had the first report uh, that there is a novel approach to facial angiofibromas and tuberous sclerosis. And uh, you can see how well the patients responded below. And that's how we started at GOSH in 2012. We started the first treating the first patient. And at that point, we had 0.1% serolimus in white soft paraffin. And how we would make, we would take serolimus tablets, crush them, put them inside the ointment, and shelf life was four weeks. So, so unfortunately, ointment does not exist in a lovely tube that you would get in the pharmacy. They would be, we would have to outsource it. They would not make it at gosh, but we would have to outsource it. Someone would crush the tablets, then put them inside the, the ointment, and the shelf life was only four weeks. That's easy if you live in London, because you have to pick it from us. But if you don't live in London, that can be very difficult. And how, what we were doing is we would do the blood test before starting, just to make sure that we are not affecting, um, uh, because at that point we were not aware whether there are going to be any side effects in children. So we would do the blood test before we'd start. And then every four weeks, we would check the full blood count, kidney function test, liver function test, lipids, that's fat in the blood, and then the serolimus level. Uh, we do treat some of our patients with oral serolimus, but not the TS patient. So I would put, um, for example, patients who have vascular lesions and like a big, massive vascular lesion, we will put them on serolimus because it works quite similarly, uh, but not for the patients with TS because it, if you take it by mouth, it does have few side effects that you have to be aware of. And some of the patients might be put on everolimus, which is a similar medication, uh, but we were just wanting something that works topically, which means they're just apply on the skin and doesn't have an absorption and doesn't call all the side effects. So then we, oh, I'm sorry, my, there we go. So the first results were quite great. As you can see, in six weeks, we had quite an improvement in some patients. And then in 2013, there was that was tested, the ointment was tested, and it was the shelf life prolonged to six weeks and then to 12 weeks. 
But some patients noted that the ointment is less effective at the end of shelf life. We had a look at 42 patients then in 2014 that we've treated, and none of them had any levels of serolimus. We don't measure below 0.2 uh, nanograms in liter in the concentration, but we, we just said that it is below this, and none of them had any levels noted in the blood. None of them had any problems with, with, um, with either liver function tests or kidney function tests. And um, from the adverse effects, one patient had impetigo two weeks after they started the treatment, but then continued. And impetigo is a skin infection. It's quite common in children. And one patient complained with sensitivity, but has been treated since then. And then we stopped doing blood tests. So I, we don't do any blood tests because we didn't show that it's needed. And because we had so many patients, then the crushing of the tablets became impractical and we got the smooth ointment. Why I'm explaining all of that is you, just to see how the percentages don't always matter. And for some time we had the smooth ointment and then chunky ointment because some patients preferred that it's smooth. They didn't like the crushed tablet. Some patients found the chunky, the one that was with tablets, because you could always see a little bit of tablets in there. They found the chunky one more effective. Uh, so then we sourced the powder before they make it in tablets, and that was the smooth ointment. Uh, and then our pharmacy said, pulled the plug and said, no, you can have just a smooth one. But the 0.1%, the smooth ointment was not so effective as a, the, the chunky one, the tablety one. And I think the reason is because when you put them in the ointment, when you have a powder, it's more exposed to, to the, um, uh, to the uh, paraffin that is around. And I don't know what's happening to those molecular bonds, whether they're getting destroyed. When it's in the tablet, it's a bit more protected because it's a little lump. So for that reason, we then invented invented 0.5% serolimus for the ones that were not responsive. And actually, I've just transferred all my patients to 0.5% serolimus ointment. Why I'm explaining all of this is because there will be hopefully, hopefully soon, a perforation that will be in the tube that we will not have to make, uh, and it will just be prescribable, hopefully, um, and it will be in the form of gel. And I think that percentage is 0.2. Um, so don't think that our ointment is necessarily stronger. I, if they have more stable preparation, that will be most likely superior to ours. So difficulties that we have is that the patients have to come every three months to pick up the ointment. And we have patients from whole England and they have to regularly see me uh, every six months at least, which is quite difficult to travel sometimes. And then... I have fun of doing 80 prescriptions every three months. I've just done the, the batch two days ago um, of prescribing it all together because it's made for all patients at the same time. Uh, and that, that's unfortunately, if, you're, if you will be seen in the clinic, for example, tomorrow, that means that you will have to wait for the next batch, which will be in February, because this current one is November one is just being made. And we get the funding from GOSH. So we don't ask NHS England to fund it as the majority of other trusts will have. So they will have to fill in lots of forms to get it funded. Uh, luckily, we get this funded there. So it's very easy for us to start. Uh, I'm waiting at one point that they will tell us we can't do that anymore. But for now, no one said anything. So we're just quietly continuing. Um, COVID actually brought improvements. And if you have, if any of you have been seeing me, you know that for years I was saying I want video clinics and it didn't happen. And they said, no, that's not possible. It's not safe. And then COVID comes along and within a few weeks we had video clinics running. And if someone comes from North of England, that's very easy now to, to do video uh, follow-ups. I usually prefer seeing first time face-to-face -face and maybe just as six months, just to see how the improvement goes. And the other good thing is that our pharmacy is posting appointments to our patients at the moment. I think that will stop soon as well. But for now, while it's working, it's good. Otherwise, I've tried to batch few patients together and then one of them picks it up and then posts it to the other one because it's postable. Uh, so the patients help each other. For now, this is working brilliantly. So actually, COVID has improved things in TS, at least for my clinic. 
Okay, so those are some results of the topical cell alignments. Um, work, so the, here we have thicker angiofibromas and redder, and you can see there has been an improvement. It's not gone, but it is much better and it's not progressing. I think that's very important that it's not progressing. But where I see the most, so another case as well, um, that you can see how much thinner they became and uh, how less pronounced, but not gone still. Where I feel that there will be the most important advancements is that we start treating children early. And I recently had a student, not recently, sorry, pre-COVID, because we're not allowed at the moment, pre-COVID, I had a student in the clinic and she said, oh, I would love to see some angiofibroma. So I know how they look in the future. I was like, I'm sorry, my old patients are treated. You are not going to see anything because we start treating them as soon as the first one start budding. And if, as you can see, this child was treated quite young, a few years later, they still, they are not still, is very, very smooth. And even I, as a pediatric dermatologist, had the first look through the photographs, I would never guess this is TS. And I think this is a very good advance. But you can see some redness, but you're not sure, well, maybe it's a bit of eczema, but it's not saying TS immediately. And then again, another patient that was started treating quite early, uh, very little changes, uh, and hopefully it stays like that with the treatment. So currently I see them in the clinic. We start Cyrolima 0.5% ointment once a day as a treatment. And usually I say to apply it one hour before uh, bed so they don't smear it off when they go to sleep. And then I see them after three months and then every six months after that. Now, I feel that what we've achieved in 12 to 15 months, that's it. I don't think we can achieve much more of the thinning. And then we discuss to put them on maintenance treatment, which means uh, roughly about three times a week. It's very difficult to know what the long-term side effects are. So for 10 years, I had none, but I don't know what happens if you apply that treatment on for 25 years. Um, so for that reason, I'm a bit cautious and not that I had any in 10 years and this is a, it's a long period, but I rather be a bit cautious and then we put it down to maintenance. If the parents say, oh, it's getting redder when we decrease, we can again go to every day. I don't do any blood tests. I'm sorry I didn't put that on the slide, but what is very important is some protection. And I just say when it's from from March to October in the UK or whenever it's traveling to warm countries, a sunscreen every day is very important. And um, either the, the, the GP can prescribe that because we've noted the angiofibromas do get worse on the sun. So, uh, and the other thing is the serolimus is sort of certain, it can be immunosuppressant. So I'd rather keep the sun away from, from the face as well. Um, so for that reason, we, we suggest the photo protect, sorry, the um, uh, sun protection. So what I would like in the future is more stable preparation, which I'm very excited that it will come out. And uh, so that's already made, there are no batches. And that, for example, they see me for the first time and then this gets pres we prescribe a local hospital GP and they see me only if it's needed. And that we start early. So then we have laser treatment for angiofibromas. This is more appropriate when the, when the angiofibromas are a bit more raised. And we have, we need, if you remember from angiofibromas, we need to address redness and we need to address bumpiness. If this redness, what works is pulse dye laser. This is the laser I have because I do lots of vascular work otherwise. And we can try decreasing the redness of them by doing pulse dye laser. That laser leaves bruises wherever it has, wherever we do it because it destroys the vessel and the little vessel bleeds a little bit and then it leaves the bruising behind and the bruising stays on for about five to 15 days and then disappears. And then we have addressing bumpiness and that needs to be done with ablative laser. What ablative laser does, it takes the top surface off and that is the CO2 laser and ERYAG. Some dermatologists do them, for example, in Leeds, they have Uriag, 
uh, we have CO2, but it's mainly in the domain of plastic surgeons. So if I need to, to, to um, if the patient needs the ablative laser, I usually refer them to plastics here, even though we did, we do have a fraxillated CO2 now in dermatology as well. It's because of the COVID, we didn't start using it yet. What's important, I feel they need to be the, the laser treatment needs to be combined with the topical serolimus because if you flatten something, they will have a tendency to grow back. And what you can prevent with the topical serolimus is from them growing back again. Um, I've lumped ash leaf maculas and shangri patches together because we don't treat them. And in Caucasian population, they are sometimes barely visible. We sometimes have to look for them. Um, but if the skin is darker, they can be a bit more obvious. I've treated the patient with it. And then you can see on the first photographs, that's how we started. On the second, I was like, man, this is not really working. And then the third time, it does look better on the first photograph. But, you know, I always say when I don't feel that the photographs have been done the same way. So I think there is just the flash of light has hit skin exactly where the, uh, the, that lighter macula is. So it's not that effective, to put it that way. But it can lighten them occasionally. If they're very visible somewhere, like that was on the arm, so that would be visible with a T-shirt. We've treated that one uh, with uh, topical serolimus. Uh, but usually I don't, um, just because the topical serolab is quite expensive. One pot is about 350 pounds. So we try to concentrate that mainly on for the face. Uh, and sorry, the chagrin patch I've never treated because it doesn't cause troubles and it's usually hidden somewhere under the trousers. Now for the nail lesions, I don't have a lot of experience with those because they're usually present a bit um, later after they leave my care. But what can be done is surgery and then ablative laser, um, which means that the, the surface is taken off with the laser treatment. What I've done with my patients is I said, when you apply it on your skin, just whatever is left there, uh, put them, put them on, on the nail area. Okay, that would be all, but I would love to hear the questions and if you have any discussions or any, any of your experience, that would be lovely. Thank you very much, Leah. You finished just as I had to kneel down to plug in my laptop, so it's <laughs> perfect time for, uh, yeah, that was excellent, thank you. Um, so we, we can um, open up now for some questions as uh, as Dr. Solomon has said, um, I'm going to start with one quick question, um, which is, uh, Dr. Solomon, if someone is listening and, and watching uh, this recording and they, they, they simply just don't know where to get the ball rolling in terms of getting their, getting their, their child, um, um, uh, getting a consultation about their, their skin and everything where, where do they start should they speak to the gp or should they speak to their clinic first what what mm -hmm. should they do so um we rarely accept referrals from the gp apart from some conditions and ts is in them so if the gp writes to myself well actually they can't send the email or write me a letter what they need to do it they need to do a referral on something that's called ers or electronic referral system and it's because they can't send the letter directly we have to receive the 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 referral on ers and it's usually enough this patient has ts they are x years of age they started having angiofibromas could you please see them? That's usually enough. If your clinic refers the child, that is uh, even better because it's we will accept it from the GP. But what the referral sent, if you are seeing someone in the hospital, they can send us a letter and it's sometimes a bit easier. But we will accept both referrals uh, and then they will be booked usually with me. Very occasionally, if I'm away, they can be booked with someone else, but everyone then comes back to me and say, oh, I've seen this patient with TS. Uh, this is the photograph. Are you happy for me to do that? And then I put them on my list and they usually follow up by me. Um, 
but we accept referrals until 16 years or just before they turn 16 years of age so uh, if they're older than that bath is one of the centers that prescribe several limas and the other one is guys and thomas's um is the um dermatology clinics prescribed as well for the adults thank you thank you and uh uh Natalie, hopefully that answers your question there um we've got a question from tom as well so i'll just read it out so tom says wonderful talk as it was uh thank you for sharing uh results um uh, you have observed using topical sirolimus. Have you noticed whether topical treatment ever worsens uh, acne? Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question. So 90% um, of teenagers have acne. So I'm always on the, is it sirolimus? Is it that acne anyways? And the problem, if you, if patients take sirolimus by mouth, and that's usually for like uh, kidney transplants, the, one of the side effects is acne. So it might be sirolimus to blame, even though I, I sort of feel that that's not coming from systemic, so I hope not. But the problem might be because they are in a white soft paraffin. And that is almost like a Vaseline type, very thick ointment that they are having to put it on. And that, if you have greasy skin, plus putting this on the top, can definitely block um, the grease producing glands um, and then cause acne. So I'm not sure whether it's serolimus or whether it's ointment, but when we get the gel, then I'll have a better idea, even though 90% of teenagers can have it. And if they have angiofibromas here and they, they put ointment here, but they get, to get acne on the forehead, what I conclude usually that's not from serolimus. But if they have it in the area, I did stop a few of them and given them acne treatment uh, and then restarted on the on the serolimus a bit later. The serolimus is like on and off sometimes. It can be. I've taken a few patients off and then they say, oh, the angiofibromas got a bit redder, then we'll restart them. Uh, so uh, it's just not to let them go in children to develop too much, to put it that way, because anything that is thicker that you're trying to treat with the cream can be too far. So we sometimes leave them without the treatment a little bit and then we start them again. Thank you. So we've got um, another question from Mary here, which we've we, we've had questions around. This is about sunscreen. We've had quite a few questions about this on the, the TSA support line. So I'm glad this has come up. Uh, so Mary's um, asking how strong a uh, sunscreen should be. Um, I'm I'm guessing that I'm assuming that means with the the, the children who are having the topical sirolimus. Yeah, so that uh, for everyone actually, because we know that angiofibroma can worsen it. I am pale as a snow white and I'm a Mediterranean with dark hair and dark eyes. Um, so as a dermatologist, I will say SPF 50. The reason is people say, but 30 and 50 are very comparable. However, when they test the sunscreen, they put the whole teaspoon on their face. I am very aware about the sun and who had to see patients with melanoma and listen to all of those stories and have that in mind all the time whenever I go on the sun. I don't put a whole teaspoon on my face. So the factor that you see will actually decrease from what you, from if you apply less. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, I say SPF 50. There are a few brands that I quite like. I'm not affiliated with any of them and I use them as well. One of them is SunSense and GP can prescribe that one and you can get it in the pump and the pump can be located next to the door. So whenever someone just goes out and pu puts it on the face, um, that, uh, you know, that's very quick. The problem with that one, it can make you look white. So children usually are not too bothered with that, but with adults, I recommend La Roche-Posay Anthelios. I'm sorry, I can't speak French and that I probably butcher La Roche-Posay terribly. So if anyone speaks French, I do apologize. You have to listen to that. But La Roche-Posay Anthelios uh, for the face, factor 50. And one of my favorite is actually Heliocare and that's factor 50. For men in the audience, just to let you know, when you put it out, it looks like it's tinted moisturizer, but I promise you it's not. It's just that tiny hint of color is in there, not to make you look white. 
Mm -hmm. So that because, you know, when you put the sunscreen on, you can look chalky white because of the sunscreen. But Heliocare gel doesn't block up if, if, if it's combined with acne, it doesn't block up. And that tiny amount of color is just not to make you white. Thank you. That's um, I always find when I'm putting sunscreen on, I have to make sure I'm clean shaven or else it just ends up being all white. Yeah, thank yeah you. Heliocare gel. I've transferred so many men on that one. Believe me, that's a lovely one on Amazon. I put that down. Um, let me just to check where we're up to now. Um, I agree with what you share. Um, there's uh, Mandrula is asking if we um, can share the article link uh, regarding uh, topical sirolimus. Um, I'm sure we can. We, we can probably find that. It, it, maybe that we send it to you afterwards. Angela, but we, we'll be able to. There are plenty of them now out. That was just the first one that was in 2010. Now there are just loads and loads and loads. So if you write topical serolimus in Google, I'm sure plenty of them will come up. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Manjo. Uh, we have uh, one from Beverly. Uh, so my eight year old son is on serolimus. The label says not, not 1%. Um, WW in white soft paraffin. Did you say that you're now prescribing 0.5 to your patients? Uh, we're not seeing much improvement. Should be should we be inquiring about a stronger lotion? Yeah. So uh, Beverly, I'm not sure whether you have the little one in the pots because I think the majority of them in the UK come from Nova Lamp, and they are just packed in the little brown pot with a white label. If it's there, I presume it'll be 0.1%, but please do correct him, I'm wrong. The reason why we notice, and I said the percentage doesn't always matter. I had a few patients that I was treating with 0.5, transferred them to adult services, and they said, well, actually all the articles say it's 0.1, so we are not prescribing 0.5. And I was like, the percentage doesn't really matter. It's how it's being made, and I don't think it's being stable enough. It's not something I can test very easily, but it's just 10 years of experience. So, uh, you know, it's one side is what, what, what people with different preparations say, but the other thing is what I notice, and it might not be terribly scientific, and I do apologize for that, but I just don't find it useful. So if you don't see a lot of improvement, I would recommend that, they, that your son goes up to 0.5. Uh, if you're in England, they can be referred to me and I can have a look, and then we can ask locally to prescribe 0.5 if that would be trouble. That's great. Uh, Natalie, what we'll do, uh, your question about the names of the sun creams, we'll, um, we'll list them down, we'll, we'll speak to Dr. Solomon and we'll, we'll share them afterwards to make sure that everyone gets them, so I want, I want to find out as well. <laughs> um, so we've got a question from Melissa, which I was wondering as well, actually, because I know that you mentioned rapamycin, but now it's really, I know that uh, similar, but um, are there any other treatments being considered alongside sirolimus? Yeah, so serolimus or pomycin is the same name. So uh, it's it just it's being used interchangeably. And the, I did use in 2012, 13 was we'll a topical rapamycin. Now I said topical serolimus. Uh, okay. it, it's the same name, but so just there is no confusion. It, it's absolutely the same preparation, uh, which is an mTOR inhibitor, which means in the pathway how in TS they, there are signals that are working too much, so it dampens them down. So that's why we call, we call them mTOR inhibitors. Lasers is the first one in children uh, that we do, especially to decrease the, res the redness or if they're bumps that they are, so if the bumps or angiofibromas are more pronounced, we might use the ablative laser. Okay, thank you. Just jotting this down. Um, I think that's all the questions so far. If there are any more questions for Dr. Solomon, now is your chance. We'll give it a couple of minutes. Even if I it's live, to... yeah. Sorry, I was just going to ask. Um, in terms of ungual fibromas, I know that you said that um, you do tell some patients to that they can use some of it on their nails. Is there any way that it can be prescribed for ungual fibromas or is it only for facial angiofibromas? It's usually for for it's usually for the facial ones. So we will not they will usually not be prescribed, first of all, because adults, unlike children, are happy to see it through the removal. And with the kids, it means general anesthetic. 
Mm -hmm. So we are trying just to keep them at the bay. Um, I had a lot, quick look today just because I don't have terrible lots of experience with the periangual ones. Um, and there has been an improvement in some of them. So you might persuade your local dermatologist to prescribe it, even though I feel it will be terribly difficult just because of the expense. Um, but the ones that I treat for the face, while well, they have it, they can just rub it off, off where, if there's any growth on the nails. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've got a couple more questions here. Uh, Anthony is asking, have you used Cyrilevis on fibrous cephalic plaques? Yeah, so I did. I Whenever anything is thick, I don't think you can thin it a lot but I have started treating a patient that is very young and she start by very young I mean just just below one year of age or just you know, around first birthday and it seems it started budding on her forehead and we started treating immediately so I I think the prevention would be so much better over the years versus the treatment and this is this is the message that I'm trying to get across uh, that the prevention will be so much better. Uh, whenever something is thick, I, I don't think the cream penetrates in enough. It can be combined with ablative laser. Ablation means that you take the surface off, but it will need to continue using the serolimus because at that area, the signals will still be overpowering the TS signals and then trying to grow the lesion. So if the laser is used, I think it needs to be in combination with serolimus. Thank you again, Dr. Solomon. So we've got another question from, um, from Natalie. So Natalie says, my daughter has quite a dry scalp uh, and I, al I always thought it was cradle cap. Uh, could this be the scalp condition that you mentioned? Mm. So um, the, if it's dry scalp and flaky scalp, it's something is quite common and it's a seborrheic dermatitis, we usually call them, but they have uh, flakes in the scalp sometimes they can be a bit on the eyebrows sometimes in the nasolabial folds as well similar to angiofibromas um the the ones that i mentioned in the scalp is a usually a lump that grows so it's similar to the fibrocephalic plaque that you have on the forehead but you can have a lump in the area of the scalp it's usually good if the gp casts an eye but anything from the ts is usually a hard lump almost like a scar it feels almost like a scar hard, hard lump um so it, it might be another thing as well is in it's similar to acne which i'm never sure whether the teenagers have acne anyway so is it being worsened by sorolimus they can have other conditions thank you can you get um plaques within dermatitis as well is that just as um So seborrheic dermatitis is mainly like a red and flaky skin, and it's usually in the areas where our grease-producing glands are more active. So that will be scalp, forehead, down the nasolabial folds, and under the axilla. So you can definitely have both of them at the same time, but the seborrheic, we call it septerm, seborrheic dermatitis is, is very common. That, that, that's very common in population. So yes, you can have you can have a hard lesion in the middle of the seborrheic dermatitis, mm -hmm. and seborrheic means in the area of large grease produce and dermatitis, derma skin, itis inflammation. So whatever you want to inflame something, you just put itis at the end, like arthritis, which means joint inflammation, and derma skin, itis inflammation. So it just means inflammation of the skin where there is more grease producing glands. It's always so helpful getting the translations of the. The names were well, from your presentation it's like oh go cool. like that's what that means now thank you uh, so we've got a question from chris as well let's check if we're fine for time uh, is there a way of stopping the bleeding from angio fibromas uh, mm -hmm. this is, this is for the adults, adults. Yeah. Well, so if the angio fibroma would start bleeding i would just suggest really hard pressure and when i say hard pressure it's like really you have a white at the end of your nail meaning that you know when you press down you really press down and usually hold for 10 minutes they can be very annoying because they can trickle and trickle and trickle but the 10 minutes hold but without checking and looking checking and looking uh, sorry uh, stopping and looking stopping and looking just press down for 10 minutes with a clean tissue and hopefully that will stop it um if it's 
the bleeding comes on recurrently, which means it's just repeating and repeating, then I think it makes sense of talking to GP for referral. Sometimes plastic surgery or even dermatologist can remove the one that is usually the one or few of them that are causing troubles and they can be surgically removed. Whenever we do surgical removal, it's... Um, there's a scar so there is nothing we can remove without a scar uh, but if there's a bigger bump that bleeds I feel that a line that there has been removed and it's left a line the scar is in the form of line might be better and easier to deal with than with the bump at that area thank you Dr Solomon are there any more questions or any more experience or any experiences, yeah, absolutely. If there are any just general uh, broad comments as well, um, do feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to um, to share anything as well. Um, oh, there's a question from um, Anjula here, uh, so we'll just we'll just ask that. Uh, have you have you seen any difference in results from using uh, topical serolimus among male and female children, or or any difference uh, from ethnicity or skin color? No, actually, I, 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 I didn't. This definitely not between male and female. At the beginning, I thought that darker skin condition might have a bit less of angiofibromas, but that was when I was when I didn't have such a large cohort of patients. That that's not true. I had later patients who have very thick angiofibromas in darker skin condition. Sorry, in darker skin. So um, no, no changes. And it's everything. It's a spectrum in each one of them. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Manjua. Are there any more questions or comments? Oh, I can see Hi. Natalie's unmuted. Go for it, Natalie. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep, yeah. excellent. Thank you. Um, so I have the confetti um, pigmentation on my skin, and which has only recently sort of come to light. My daughter got diagnosed with TS about a year ago in lockdown. Mm. Um, when we took her to the bath clinic, um, he asked us if any of us were experiencing any symptoms and he put the blue light over my body and noticed that I had confetti pretty much all over my trunk, mm -hmm. arms, legs. Um, I believe I've got a couple of ash leaf spots as well. Um, we've done the genetic testing because Brielle has been, my daughter's been diagnosed with a more complex strain of TS2, I believe. Um, so my husband and I have been asked to do blood tests, which we've done recently. In your experience, is this sounding more like the fact that this has come from a hereditary, maybe me? So I'm so sorry, I need to plug in and I'm sorry, I listened through everything, but if if my, I think my laptop is going to go off. Oh, that's okay. A minute, so I'm just going to plug this in. And then I can continue. So um, no, uh, no, because the genetic change doesn't matter if it occurs from from the start or was it inherited for the parents. The hyperpigmentations we sometimes see in the general population as well. But if there's a proper ash leaf macule, that's that is one of the major signs. Okay. But you will need two. Two ash leaf. No, you will need oh, two sorry. major signs. So okay. You know, because there's diagnostic criteria, and for for the skin, the, those are angiofibromas, the ash leaf, chagrin, um, and periungual um, right. uh, fibromas, or the fibrous plaque. So uh, okay. it, that will be combined with anything else, anywhere else in the body. Uh, okay. But genetic testing is so much easier now. Before that, we had to guess and so on. Yeah. Luckily, not in my med me medicine time, but it was quite a lot of guessing. Is it? Isn't it? Is it? Isn't it? When it's genetic testing, it's usually very easy. However, not all of the mutations have been discovered. But if they were discovered in your in your daughter, then it's much easier to go back and you look at yours. Fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Pleasure. No, thank you, Natalie. Thank you for all of your questions. Um, so we've got uh, one more from, from Teresa. So uh, if a child has mild skin issues, is this likely to get worse as an adult? Or if an adult has a mild TSE skin condition can get worse as as they get older as well yes so um 
usually if they're mild, hopefully they will stay mild, but they can always be treated. And one of the difficulties I see, because I treat all of them, I don't know how, how, how severe they will get. Is it, I, I don't know, because they're all treated. So I might be treating someone who has very mild skin changes and would always have very mild skin changes, but maybe I'm preventing someone who would have really thick angiofibroma. So that's one of the difficulties when you treat them very young because you can't leave them to develop and say, oh yeah, 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 I'm doing a good thing because you can't thin them back down. But hopefully if they have mild skin issues, and by issues, I will say angiofibromas mainly. Now, depends also how old they are. If they're two, almost they, they will have very, very sm small amount of, or, or very thin angiofibromas. It was just maybe red dots. If they're 12, then hopefully they are close to the puberty. So whatever we would see on the face, we would see already. Um, I have seen an article, and I think it's available of, a patient who was follow up for 80 years in the dermatology department actually at the quite old age so, sorry let, let me rephrase this um, when they were about 80 to 90, 80 years of age everything started dampening down so they had a big fibrous plaque it became less pronounced the angiofibromas became less pronounced but we are actually interested in, in the time um, that there is the most activity happening in the life that they are less pronounced. So um, hope they, they might get worse over the time, but it's, it's usually the patients will tell me this is still getting worse. And some of them will say, no, it's still the same. So it's again, different. I hope I didn't babble a lot and I hope I've answered the question. Some of them are really difficult to answer because it's just, there's not enough knowledge. So I do apologize. I hope I didn't take that in too wide no not at all some i think you I think you did thank you um are there any final questions for for, for dr son or indeed any any comments um we'll give it another 30 seconds or so just to see i think this must be the 30th or so virtual events we've done and i've learned so much in this one i must say so yeah it's been, it's been excellent. Thank you. Looks like that is it. Well, thank you everyone for coming. It's great to see so many people coming, coming along. Um, as I said, we will be uh, sharing a recording of, of this so, so everyone can, can benefit. It's been such a, such a useful and uh, an interesting talk. Um, it's, just to say a huge thank you to again uh, Dr. Sun for, for giving your time to talk talk today. Um, I can see you've but you know, I'm going to copy and paste the names of those uh, the sun cream so we can share them afterwards. Thank you. Um, and yes, so to everyone else, keep an eye on, on everything that we're doing at the TSA. We'll have uh, plenty more events coming up. The next one is um, a sibling focused event that we're doing with the charity SIPs, it should be a, a really great workshop. We've got very limited numbers on that though, if you, uh, if you were interested. And then following that, we have an event with um, Dr. Simon Johnson, all about LAM, so TSE LAM, the lung condition. Um, so yeah, so I hope everyone's enjoyed it um, and I'll end, it, I'll end the meeting now. Um, so yeah, so just a big thank you once again to everyone. So thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.